So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here to this uh, episode of Green Left TV and I'd like to especially welcome our guest Paul LeBlanc who is a uh, socialist, a long-time socialist from the United States. He's uh, renowned for having written Lenin and the Revolutionary Party among a number of other books. Uh, he was uh, formerly a member of the US Socialist Workers Party. Uh, more recently he was a member of the International Socialist Organization which has recently dissolved and, uh, and a number of other organizations over the years as well as I understand it. So yeah, uh, please, uh, thanks, thanks for being here, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we wanted to talk about the, I guess, the current status in, of US politics, and in particular, developments on the left, and I guess what strategy for leftists to pursue in the, in the current situation. Uh, the US Democratic primary debates are up and running, and a discussion is opening up about the presidential elections next year. Can you talk about the political context in which this campaign is occurring? Um, yeah, can you, can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, there are uh, a number of crises uh, in this country and in the world and in this country. Uh, and they include uh, various aspects of an economic crisis, uh, uh, the slippage of the United States as a world power. It's still a world power, but uh, uh, less secure in its power than it uh, has been for uh, a, a very, very long time. Uh, the uh, rich are getting richer, uh, but at the expense of the overwhelming majority of people. And there have been, uh, 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 there's been stagnation and decline in the quality of life for a majority of the American people, a majority of the working class. Um, and people feel that. Uh, there are declining social services and social services are being cut. Um, there's uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, people feel that uh, their children's future uh, is going to be uh, worse than, than their own, uh, or that it looks like that may be the way it's shaping up. And this is quite a shock to uh, generations of people that had believed in the so-called American dream for a number of decades. So that's one aspect of the reality. Um, there's also climate change, uh, which uh, despite climate deniers, uh, things are changing. And I think that's extremely disconcerting. Uh, the world is uh, uh, changing not only in terms of climate uh, uh, and weather, that kind of thing, but uh, there is uh, growing instability all over the world. Uh, growing uh, reaction ag against a, a terrible uh, uh, situation for more and more people. Um, and of course, we have uh, probably the very worst president in U.S. history. Um, and uh, he has uh, stirred up uh, bigotry. He's used a fake populism to uh, rally support for himself, but uh, at the expense, again, of large numbers of people. You've got uh, uh, periodic mass shootings from deranged right-wing killers. Um, this is some of the context in which this uh, presidential debate is taking place. Um, and there's a large number of Democratic Party candidates uh, seeming to be vying with each other to face Trump. Um, and uh, we'll be talking, we'll be focused later on in the discussion, but that's some of the context. There's another aspect of the context which uh, I think is very important and will also come up, and that is there's been a um, sort of a slow-moving deep over the past several decades, they, what I consider to be uh, a radicalization within the American working class, within the population as a whole, and that radicalization is accelerating uh, within the, con the kind of context that I've described. Um, and there are growing, uh, and again, periodic mass actions around various issues, uh, mass protests uh, over the past several years. Uh, the Occupy movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Million Women's March, uh, as well as a, a rise in strikes among teachers and uh, a ferment within sections of the working class. So that's another aspect of the context. So you mentioned that um, Trump is possibly the worst president the United States has ever had. I mean, there's obviously going to be a lot of people that are thinking Trump is just so bad that anybody the Democrats put up 
even if it's like a really conservative figure like Joe Biden, should be supported. Mm-hmm. Now, socialists, yeah. on the other hand, have traditionally had this perspective that uh, independence from the Democratic Party is a fundamental principle. So uh, can you explain, I guess, uh, before we get into the current situation, can you explain why it is that even in the face of, you know, deeply conservative and, and reactionary Republican candidates, socialists have always put forward this idea about political independence and, um, and, and you know, building our, building our own strength? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, one thing is, unfortunately, not all socialists have put that forward. Uh, a relatively small section of the socialist movement, revolutionary socialists, have consistently argued uh, the absolute necessity of uh, political independence of the working class and arguing for the political independence of the working class from the two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, which are both capitalist parties. Um, And uh, there's um, a couple of aspects to this, of course, Uh, If you're in favor of the working class winning the battle for democracy, as Marx and Engels put it in the Communist Manifesto, the working class, the majority class, taking power uh, and overturning capitalism, it's uh, impossible to do that if you're enmeshed in a capitalist political party. So it's necessary for workers to stand up for themselves, to stand up for their class, to stand up for the genuine interests of the majority of people against the interests of uh, uh, big business profiteers. Um, There's another uh, aspect to this that um, uh, revolutionary socialists uh, have advanced, and this is in argument with many socialists, uh, members of the Communist Party, uh, Socialist Party in, in the past, uh, liberals who are left-leaning liberals who argue uh, you've got to defeat the candidate who's furthest to the right. And generally over the past uh, half century that has meant uh, the Republican Party. You've got to oppose the Republican Party uh, supporting Democratic Party, Democratic Party liberal, Democratic Party centrist against the more reactionary a section of the uh, uh, capitalist class, the most uh, uh, reactionary and conservative and right-wing sectors in the American political scene, you've got to support the Democrats against that. Um, A problem with that is that the Democrats traditionally, like the Republicans, are not able to uh, uh, actually face in an adequate way, a way that's adequate for the majority of the people, Uh, the crises of American capitalism. They are committed to American capitalism. Therefore, they can make all kinds of campaign promises. Uh, One of the uh, most uh, 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 inspiring uh, examples of that was President Obama, Uh, and especially the first time he was running. He sounded like a radical. He sounded wonderful. Change, hope, it was all going to be great. But in point of fact, he did not have a program. He wasn't committed to... Uh, facing the power of the big corporations, facing down the power of the big corporations, actually helping to mobilize masses of people to fight for their interests. Instead, he uh, went along with the, uh, the dynamics of the status quo, continuation of the status quo, <clears throat> and people's lives weren't improved, they got worse. Things have been getting worse over the past several decades, and people whose lives are getting worse, they're looking around for solutions. If there's no solution to the left, because the left is too busy supporting liberals and and centrists who favor capitalism, if there's no alternative to the left, they'll be looking to the right. And American politics, in many ways, to a large extent because of that, has shifted to the right. Uh, And now we have President Trump. Um, So uh, supporting Joe Biden, well, Trump is, uh, is horrible, but Trump isn't the worst there could be. If we're supporting Biden and we're not building a credible, effective left-wing alternative that's in the interests of the uh, American working class, um, then if Biden gets in, he's going to do what he's going to do, and people are going to get increasingly desperate and look for alternatives, and the alternatives will be even further to the right than they are now. So revolutionary socialists 
insist on the necessity of building an independent political force in the interests of the working class uh, and uh, composed of, uh, of uh, more and more members of the working class fighting for their rights. We've experienced a similar thing in Australia with um, the, the, our conservative Liberal Party drifting to the right and the Labor Party not challenging them and drifting further to the right behind them. And that's, uh, we, you know, obviously it's not the same in Australia as in the United States, but there's a, yeah. there's a similar dynamic there. Um, though there's obviously a... Um, yes, uh, yeah, yes, it's similar. It's, it's not, unfortunately, it's not unique. Now, my understanding is you've basically put forward an argument that we're now facing a new situation uh, and not, I guess, to take away from that importance of building an independent socialist movement, but now I think to put in your words, a spreading and deepening crisis of capitalism coupled with a widespread phenomenon of open socialists making use of the Democratic Party ballot line in order to help build an explicitly socialist movement. So tell us how you see what this new situation means. Well, I've already sketched out some of the context, um, uh, which includes a growing radicalization <coughs> within the population. And over the past few decades, although it seemed in some ways like things were just inexorably moving to the right, there were increasing numbers of people, young people, but also others, <coughs> who were reacting uh, in a more left-wing way. And so you had this mass uh, phenomenon of the Occupy movement, which was very powerful, not just on Wall Street, not just in New York City, but all across the country, definitely in Pittsburgh, where I live, and many other cities as well. And the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and women's struggle, especially when uh, Trump was elected, an almost spontaneous uprising of uh, women, an organization of women and their allies, uh, the Mill Million Women March as well as a proliferation of strikes among teachers and, and other workers. So there's been this kind of radicalization that has been taking place. Mm. Within that context, uh, Bernie Sanders in particular uh, made a decision. Now Sanders is an has polit uh, traditionally been an independent candidate as the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, as a congressman from that district and then as a U.S. Senator from Vermont. He has uh, traditionally uh, 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 called himself a socialist. He's been indep an independent, independent of the two parties, <clears throat> although he's been a very moderate socialist, a reformist socialist, but still that's unique, almost unique on the American scene or has been until recently. Uh, but he made a decision, I think, based on the larger uh, radicalization that was taking place and given the gutlessness and ridiculous uh, 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 inability of the Democratic Party so-called liberals to uh, resist the right-wing uh, onslaught uh, he put forward a very what for the United States was a very radical social reform program and he used the term socialism uh, uh, to define what he believed in uh, and he uh, argued against a, an economy uh, and a political setup that was run by the billionaires for the billionaires at the expense of the rest of us and so forth. He put forward that perspective using the word socialist and large number, and, but he was doing it within the Democratic Party. Now, if he had done this as uh, an independent candidate outside of the Democratic Party, he would have gone the way of various other protest candidates, in my opinion. Uh, uh, Ralph Nader, various other good people uh, have not been able to mount a, a, a big enough uh, challenge because there are large numbers of working class people in the United States who are afraid of throwing their vote away on a protest candidate. But what uh, Sanders did was he ran inside the Democratic Party and within that context, he got uh, uh, an avalanche of support. Uh, he did so much better than was anticipated. And it's anticipated also, or it's uh, uh, speculated uh, that uh, it's conceivable if the Democratic Party leadership wasn't playing dirty pool, that he could have won 
he could have won the uh, nomination. And then uh, some people at least feel he could have uh, mounted an effective challenge to Trump and defeated Trump in the presidential election. Um, whether or not that is a realistic scenario of what might have happened, he changed the political dialogue in the political mainstream of the United States so that large numbers of people were now using the word socialism as in a positive way, in a way that pitted the 99% against the 1%, the majority of us against the billionaires. Um, and uh, uh, so that was a, a significant shift in, on the American political scene. So you, and, well, I mean, talking about that shift, I mean, like there's actually, it's, it is pretty clear when you look at the Democratic primaries, there has been a shift 2016 to, to 2019. And there's now a lot more uh, progressive or pseudo progressive candidates uh, that, that are contesting the Democratic primaries. Do you want to talk about any, like, do you believe that contrast still exists that Bernie Sanders is, uh, is a standout candidate because of those things you mentioned? Or do you think that he is now one of other progressive candidates? Or perhaps could you make some, some you know, could you make some analysis sure. about Bernie Sanders and the other progressive candidates? Sure. Um, there are several things that happened based on the 2016 campaign. As I said before, socialism became part of the mainstream political dialogue in a way that it hadn't been for uh, many, 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 many decades. That's one thing. Uh, related to that, there were large numbers of young people mobilizing for the first time in their lives around the Bernie Sanders campaign and around the idea of some kind of socialism. Related to that was the uh, amazing growth out of that of what had been a very moderate and uh, uh, not a very impressive uh, uh, social democratic organization, left social democratic organization, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, uh, where it grew from a few thousand paper members, aging paper members, to a, uh, a membership of 60,000 uh, and uh, 60,000 largely young, vibrant young uh, activists. Uh, and among these activists, there were some who were doing what Sanders did, which was running as an open socialist on the Democratic Party ballot line. And in some cases, they started winning elections. A couple of state legislators in uh, in uh, Pittsburgh beat longtime machine Democratic Party candidates uh, in the Democratic Party primary, and they're now sitting in the uh, Pennsylvania state legislature. Uh, and there are there's the whole squad, a uh, small squad, but a squad of open socialists who ran on the Democratic Party ballot line who uh, are now sitting in U.S. Congress. Uh, similar things have happened in various cities, including in, uh, in Chicago recently. So this is a new phenomenon. Um, and the difference between Sanders and uh, most of the other Democratic Party candidates is that most of the other Democratic Party candidates uh, are aligned with so-called corporate liberals, corporate interests. They do not want to alienate big business. Um, and uh, Sanders doesn't have that point of view. There's another, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren, who's also relatively radical, but she continues to defend capitalism. Sanders is unique in, at least in some ways, sometimes pointing the finger at capitalism as the source of the problem and talking about something, socialism, uh, as an alternative to that. Mm. So this in some ways gets us to the, to the number of the discussion because you have recently argued that openly socialist candidates who have a chance of getting elected, even when running on the Democratic Party ballot line, should receive at least critical support from revolutionary socialists. So can you tell us about your views on that? What right. kind of support um, are you thinking about and what sort of criti criticisms do you think should be made? Sure. Um, one thing is, uh, I think this situation that I've described is time limited. That is, you have large numbers of people rallying to uh, can 
So in any event, the, the current situation is you've got a number of candidates uh, who've win, who are winning in some cases, or at least winning large vote totals, uh, who uh, identify as socialists and who are far more radical, far more to the left than the Democratic Party as a whole. And they are winning a lot of support and generating all kinds of uh, development and consciousness of large numbers of people in the country and expectations among increasing numbers of people in the country. Um, and I think this is time limited because the leadership of the Democratic Party, which is absolutely in favor of corporate capitalism, imperialism, militarism, the whole package, uh, but capitalism with a human face, with a more human face than, than Trump's face, um, they will not tolerate their party uh, uh, being uh, pulled leftward by this group of socialists. And what they will do is come down on these uh, folks real hard, uh, try to corrupt them. And if those who are corrupted, there, there are some who may be corrupted, who will go along with the Democratic Party pro-capitalist leadership. And there are others who won't. But the large numbers of people who are angry, who are increasingly militant, who are increasingly radicalized, who are increasingly thinking, yeah, some kind of socialism. That's what we need, economic democracy, not the capitalist dictatorship of capitalism. Large numbers of people are not going to uh, uh, give up on their hopes and, and need to, uh, uh, who uh, claim to be socialist go over to the other side or are repressed by the Democratic Party leadership. So that what I anticipate over the next several years is a political break, a significant political break, or at least the possibility of a mass break from the Democratic Party of large numbers of people who are going in a socialist direction. And in this particular moment, I think it makes sense for revolutionary socialists to say, yeah, critical support to socialists running on the Democratic Party ballot line. We're voting for them not because uh, uh, they're Democrats. We're not voting for Democrats in general, but we're voting for socialists. We need socialism. We need socialism as a political force in the United States. Um, and I think that will help to feed into this dynamic of uh, a, a possible creation of a mass socialist movement uh, and a, a socialist electoral force, independent socialist electoral force, you know, within the next several years. That's a possibility now. That's new. Um, at the same time, it is essential that this be critical support. The main thing is not to put one's faith in Bernie or AOC and the socialist squad uh, who were elected in Congress. Uh, the, it's the masses of people who are ready to struggle, who are feeling the pain and the hurt and the anger and being mobilized uh, uh, to struggle for their rights. Um, that is the force that is to a certain extent behind these socialist candidates running in the Democratic Party, and we have to be linked to that. But at the same time, Every time Bernie Sanders does something right, or AOC or the others do something right, we should support them and say, yes, that's great. And any time they do something that we think is wrong, we need to say, we think that's wrong. That's not going to help us. I'm in favor of the Green New Deal that will result in uh, a, uh, a restructuring of the American economy to eliminate joblessness, to eliminate poverty, and to eliminate the uh, 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 pollution and degradation of the environment. But if uh, people putting forward the Green New Deal are also voting for billions of dollars for the military industrial complex, that hurts the Green New Deal. That, that, and we have to say that. And it, it is not in the interest of the American people or people around the world to have U.S. Uh, uh, military going into various countries to uh, shore up and defend right-wing dictators against the needs of the people. We have to say that. We have to explain that. If any of the uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, candidates in the Democratic Party are taking a different line, a wrong line, we have to frankly say that. We have to persuade the supporters 
of those candidates. This is a terrible mistake. This is not in our interest. So it may be that Bernie Sanders and some of the other candidates will, will be persuaded by the mass pressure of their supporters to go in a better direction on some of these issues. Uh, but if they don't, then uh, it's still necessary, more necessary than ever, to be critical of them um, because uh, that, uh, that's not going to get us where we need to go. Uh, the main thing is not trying to persuade Bernie Sanders uh, or the other candidates. The main thing is what's happening in the consciousness, uh, in the beliefs, in the actions of the masses of people who've been drawn to their campaigns and who are being drawn to uh, the perspectives of socialism. Uh, and there is a new situation where that may result in a socialist movement. So it's necessary to speak to them in ways that they can understand, be supportive of certain candidates that are going in the right direction up to a point, but to be critical of those candidates when they're veering off in a direction that's not in the interests of uh, the American working class or the, uh, the principles of socialism and democracy. Well, one thing that does strike me in this whole discussion uh, about left-wing strategy, um, the revolutionary left, especially in the imperialist countries, is very familiar with losing. And um, I think sometimes what we need to do is we need to work out what are the strategies to actually to win. And it's not necessarily a matter of just looking in the history books and, uh, and looking what socialists have done in the past, but actually trying to work out in the current circumstances what is the, what is the strategy that can win. And, and I guess when you talk about the prospects of a potentially new mass socialist movement, I guess that's actually that's the, that is the, the interesting thing or the, the, you know, the inspiring thing about this whole situation. And I think that... On the one hand, on the one hand, uh, false hopes aren't going to get you anywhere. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you if you sort of give up in a where the pseudo radical posture of its um is all hopeless, uh, that's not going to get you anywhere right. either. To me, I feel like this is a very hopeful situation. I mean, I think there are a lot of things that are you know you know that are very positive wow. and inspiring about the current situation. Yeah. Yeah, we live in the worst of times and the best of times. There is, it is a very hopeful situation. It's a very dangerous situation. But there is, I believe, there is a possibility of building a mass socialist movement in my lifetime. And my life ain't going to last that much longer. Um, and a socialist movement that will be capable in the near future maybe a little after my time, but in the near future, of um, effectively challenging capitalism in the United States, as well as in other countries, uh, effectively challenging capitalism and winning. And that's what we've got to be reaching for. One of the big differences between our time and the time of Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, Antonio Gramsci, uh, you know, some of the uh, great revolutionary Marxist theorists of the past is that they lived in a context in which there was a global labor movement that was socialist, that was animated by uh, revolutionary Marxist ideas. There were other ideas contending within the movement, but uh, there was a, uh, a mass socialist working class movement. That does not exist in the United States that hasn't existed in the United States or come close to existing in the United States for a very long time. We are facing a period of time now, uh, we're facing a situation within which it may be possible to bring that, help bring that into being. And that is a very hopeful thing. And then we're talking about really fighting for socialism, not just protesting against uh, uh, the forces of, uh, of, of evil, but overturning, challenging and overturning capitalism, building a mass socialist consciousness and mass action around that consciousness. That is a perspective that I think makes sense uh, over the next uh, period of time, over the next five and 10 years. Um, well, I mean, is there anything else that you'd like to say? I mean, your, your position has been uh, criticised by other socialists, although I think in some ways you've maybe just um, just answered. Well, do, do you want to talk about the discussion that's opened up since, since you have um, since you've put forward yeah. this perspective? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, 
and there's a, a ferment within the left. Uh, there are lots of people who are uh, my generation. You know, we've been through all kinds of things and we've read the, the Marxist classics. And, and some of these comrades um, who've been through uh, traumatic expulsions and splits and collapse of hopes that they had for the red 60s or the red 70s or the red 80s. And now they've kind of given up is my impression. That is, they are not active. Um, but they, they know the theories. And uh, some of them play a role of commenting on what's happening in the world, what's happening on the left, what's wrong with the left, what's stupid about the left, so forth and so on, but are not engaged in actually trying to help build a left that can win. Um, and for such people uh, who know the, the, the various details and nuances, or at least some of the details and nuances of revolutionary theory, the kinds of things I'm saying uh, don't measure up to what Lenin was saying or Luxembourg was saying in their context. But that was a very different context. Uh, uh, revolutionary Marxists, the necessity of the political independence of the working class from the capitalist class. That is fundamental. And for the United States, the, uh, there has been, um, uh, within the left, um, the Communist Party and the old Socialist Party uh, in the, uh, the days of Norman Thomas and, the, and Michael Harrington and so on, um, there has been a commitment to working inside the Democratic Party um, in a reformist way, in a non-revolutionary way. This is the best we can do. It's better than you know uh, going further to the right. Um, there were various rationalizations, and some of the comrades see the kind of thing that I'm saying is a new version of that. And I don't think it is. I think it's it's something quite different. But some of the criticism has come out of uh, uh, those kinds of concerns. Um, there are some people who, um, uh, and not just older people, uh, some younger people, and I used to be somewhat this way myself, as a revolutionary, there was revolutionary posturing and rhetoric, but not enough thinking of how do we make this real in the actual context that we're facing. And, and uh, I think some of the criticism comes out of that. I think that some of the people who've been raising criticisms um, they, some of the points that they're making, there's validity to some of the points they're making. Um, there are dangers in uh, working within the Democratic Party. Some of the, the socialists who are working in the Democratic Party now have an illusion that somehow they can take over the Democratic Party and they've got to stay in the Democratic Party a long time in order to be able to accomplish that. I believe that would be a disaster. And some of the critics uh, of what I'm saying are concerned about that also. So there's a, a discussion, a critical discussion. Some of the criticisms, uh, I think, tend to be dogmatic or sectarian. And some of them are coming from a place that uh, uh, I, I think is serious and, and worth considering and, and discussing further. The main thing is we've got to be engaged in action, in activism. We've got to be testing things out. Uh, when we take a look at uh, some of the comrades, Lenin uh, in Russia or Trotsky in uh, certain contexts, shocked their more orthodox Marxist comrades uh, by uh, grabbing hold of new opportunities that seemed to go in a direction that uh, was not consistent with the old Marxist dogmas. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to do that in order to uh, win uh, uh, things that can't be won otherwise in the new situation. Uh, you have to be ready to take risks. You have to be ready to possibly make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. But sometimes they're not mistakes uh, and you learn from that also. Uh, that's the kind of fluid and exciting situation I think that we're in today. Uh, and uh, so that's the
uh, and tactics uh, for the present time. In terms of the criticisms, of, criticisms of Bernie Sanders, it's true that he frames socialism fairly much in the in, in the terms of a of a well, of a welfare state, and I think you and I both conceive of socialism in a much broader context than that. So I want to talk about um, limitations and serious limitations that I see with uh, uh, Sanders. Um, and uh, there are similar limitations one can uh, discuss with some of the other candidates, but Sanders is in the forefront at the moment. And I've talked about some of the things that I see that are positive. I think that uh, and you alluded to in uh, in your comment uh, is that it's not a definition of social. Sometimes he's talking about a social democratic welfare state that exists in or that he believes exists in Denmark or Sweden or Norway. Um, and sometimes he's talking about Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal policies. And it's important to recognize that uh, in Scandinavia, in the Scandinavian countries, you have capitalism, you do not have socialism. I've talked to uh, socialist comrades in those countries and they say, no, we have capitalism. This is not socialism. There are good uh, welfare state reforms that the labor movement fought for and won, but that's not, that's not socialism. There's still capitalism and, and it is undermining uh, the gains that we made. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was very clear. He was in favor of capitalism and he was helping to uh, implement New Deal reforms in order to, and welfare state type reforms in order to save capitalism. Um, and I think it's a mistake for Sanders sometimes to slip into that kind of rhetoric and that kind of glorification of those things. He has a model. He has a model, one of his heroes, or at least he says he's one of his heroes, who beautifully was able to talk to masses of American workers in a very persuasive way about what socialism really is, Eugene Victor Debs. And it is essential that socialists put forward the Debs message of socialism, in which each and every person can live a decent life and we all have a say in the decisions that affect our lives and affect our society, not just politically, but especially in terms of the economy. So that is one uh, limitation of Sanders. Another limitation, and it may be related to this, is that in regard to foreign policy, he has not put forward a consistent uh, uh, understanding of US foreign policy as representing the interests of the capitalist class, uh, of uh, the multinational corporations at the expense of the American people and at the expense of peoples all over the world and that uh, U.S. foreign policy has been designed traditionally and still is designed to meet the interests of U.S. multinational corporations at the expense of the majority of people of the world. And it is essential that socialists uh, uh, make that clear and talk about that in a very serious way. And to the extent that Sanders fails to do that to the extent that Sanders sometimes does the opposite, it is essential to criticize him, not to denounce him in ways where his, his uh, uh, supporters won't understand what we're talking about, but rather to explain it in terms where his supporters will understand what we're talking about. And the model, one of the great models for this was Eugene Victor Debs. It can be done. It can be put into the language of, America, of the American working class so that people understand it and get it. Uh, so these are limitations of Sanders and some of the others. Hopefully they'll overcome those limitations, but if they don't, we've got to overcome those limitations as we're building the mass socialist movement that we need to uh, uh, advance the interests of the American working class majority. Well, that is, uh, that's perhaps a hopeful uh, point to end. I think as, um, as you have pointed out a number of times, uh, the, the question of socialism in the United States is much bigger than just Bernie Sanders or AOC. And uh, there is, you know, there, I think the, the source of hope is a, a vibrant renewal of the, of the socialist movement, which we have been 
um, which we have been seeing. And I'd like to thank you for uh, for joining us today to discuss um, for to, to discuss these developments in U.S. politics.